Great experiences build great leaders. Great leaders build great teams. This is Building Great Sales Teams. All right, guys, welcome back to Building Great Sales Teams. I've got David Rodriguez today. He's the founder and president over at TLC Advisors LLC and a fractional VP at Sales Acceleration. He's been doing sales and, and strategy with over 30 years of experience at Fortune 50 companies and portfolio companies owned by private equity. Now he partners with small businesses to build sales infrastructure by implementing the right tools, processes, and team to meet the business goals. David, my favorite accomplishment though, is you being a husband of 31 years. That's amazing, brother. Thank you so much. It's uh, been a lot of hard work and a lot of compromise, but it's, it's been good. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here, Doug. I really appreciate it. All right. So let's get right into it. Um, Zach Hawkins introduced us. We jumped yep. on a call. Uh, I felt like there was a lot of alignment there. And as well as I wanted to get you on the show specifically for your Fortune 50 and private equity experience. And the idea behind it is, OK, let's let's figure out what what is great about Fortune 50 companies and uh, in private equity and give that to the listeners and then also talk about, OK, what doesn't work so well as you're scaling your business and make sure that they avoid that, too. So that, that's kind of some, some of what I want to go through there. But. I got to ask you this. Why did you leave Fortune 50 in the first place to work with small businesses? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. You know, literally, I spent, you know, the better part of 25 years in corporate America prior to private equity. And so when I think about what I learned at, in the corporate world, it was a lot of I called it a poor man's MBA, you know, because I come from very humble beginnings. I think you and I talked about it. Yeah. And and I came from those beginnings of really being, you know, not even knowing what college was, you know, and not and, and not having the 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 wherewithal, the family having the wherewithal to send me. I, I was able to get to college, one of five kids. And I literally got into corporate America really to really build the foundation. And what's good about Fortune 50 companies is they have a lot of tools and a lot of training and a lot of infrastructure and a lot of the things. Uh, there's great people too, lots of talented folks around in, in big Fortune 50 companies that I learned a lot when I was there. I never went and got an MBA, as I said, but I really learned a lot, you know, and, and that was the foundation of really building out what I believed was my passion to go and be a leader and be passionate about giving back to small and medium businesses. I'm entrepreneur minded, but I was always in a Fortune 50 environment in small divisions of that Fortune 50 company. Now, that makes a ton of sense. I think uh, later in life, as you want to have more impact, you want to get closer to the ground floor of where a lot of these Fortune 50 companies started, right? Yeah. And and kind of giving them that that leg up. I would imagine can be huge for for the impact that you're going to make with them. Yeah, and a, and a great one, Doug, that that to mention is everybody knows Michael Dell. You know, Michael Dell mm -hmm. started out of his dorm in, in at the University of Texas, and mm -hmm. you know, I heard stories from when he started it and him having to convince his parents and him going and doing what he was doing in his dorm. You know, to really go out and be uh, kind of a an entrepreneur of saying, I want to go direct to the customer. And so what he did is he built that out, and there were times that he couldn't make payroll. And I remember, you know, some of the stories that were told over the 15 years I was there of where he came from. And I, I wanna say it's 39 years this year that Dell's been open, you know? And so you think of someone like Michael Dell that started even without a degree to where he is now and, you know, buying and selling companies and going private and going public again, it's an amazing story. So it's an entrepreneur. There's lots of entrepreneurs at big companies and, and that's where uh -huh. they start is really to bring that out. Yeah, no, I love that story specifically because he's from the University of Texas. So there you go. There I'm, a, you go. <laughs> I'm just a T-shirt fan. I never graduated from there, but uh, I, I do appreciate that 100 percent. I can't believe it's only been 39 years. That's crazy. I thought yeah. it was longer. You know, I thought he was like up there with the Microsofts and stuff, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Makes a ton yeah. of sense. OK, so what do you think are some impactful strategies that that you saw done well in in, for, in the Fortune 50 space in terms of sales and sales teams? 
Yeah. And so I'll say this is that what Fortune 50 company, especially, you know, uh, just uh, taking Dell as an example, mm -hmm. you know, I owned a, a $400 million business. It was a, a managed service provider channel sales organization. And it was a very reactive uh, piece of the business where it was only growing 1% year on year. Mm -hmm. And I was working for the, um, before I took on that role, and I think we talked about this, I have a finance background and I've been a global controller of a $7 billion channel business at Dell at one point. Mm -hmm. and, and I've done a lot of different things, but in that time I learned that there was a segment of that division of that $7 billion business that in the in North America that was being underserved. And so what happens at big, you know, big companies is that sometimes you get lost and there's so many uh, objectives, so many initiatives yeah. and it takes somebody with a lot of uh, curiosity and a lot of foresight to really go in and say, I think that there is an opportunity here. And so this $400 million business, there were small, medium, uh, mom and pop, if you will, channel partners that would sell into other small businesses, you know, product services and 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 the, and the like, and right. and we were serving them reactively as a as an inbound call center, and so I went in and said, listen, I think that this business could actually grow at twenty percent or more if we were able to go and and do a multi tier focus of doing inbound online as well as outbound and have an outbound sales team give me the investment for 12 folks and i'm going to put them around the country here's where our market share is here's where the share of wallet is and how we can actually grow with those different partners and what's great about big companies like that if you have folks like that will come in with that curiosity they'll give you the investment they'll give you a short leash right. to, to to deliver but they will basically say, yeah, here's the business case. Here's the, the financials. Here's where you got to go with it. And so we took that company and we basically segmented, you know, all the different uh, geographies as well as what type of partners and what industries that they were serving. And we then uh, located out outside salespeople. We partnered them with the inside sales team. And then we pushed everything into online that was at below a certain level of revenue. And, and we then communicated that. And so after doing that, we were able to take that 1% historical growth year on year to over 20, 30%, you know, just within like 13, 14 months. And so that's an example of you, you can get lost in big companies, big mm -hmm. 50 companies. You have to actually be entrepreneurial minded to go create those opportunities to go really drive to the bottom line. And I've always said this. I mean, you know, I always want to be externally relevant. Uh, mm -hmm. not just internally relevant. So I'm, I'm right. always looking for the customer. And that's where I get out of my finance, you know, hat. And I put on my sales hat and I want to be a right. customer. Okay. So let me, let me kind of like break this down real quick, because I think uh, not everybody's going to understand completely everything you just went through. And I'm, I want to make sure I understand it too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so when you talked about these partners, these are people that maybe resell the computers and the programs that go with them and everything. And so these are mom and pop electronics stores or regional type electronic stores. And you kind of segmented, you know, all right, how much business are they doing? And then kind of uh, use your strategies to uh, attack them depending on the segment. Exactly. So if you think about um, HP, Lenovo, um, Asus, and all these IT companies, you know, that, that are out there, mm -hmm. there, there's two routes to market. There's a direct route to market that you right. sell direct into a customer, you know, whoever's using that product or service or, you know, converge infrastructure, whatever it is that they need to do for their, their internal infrastructure. Then you have the indirect market, which is that route to market goes through channel partners. The right. channel partners are businesses that are, think, an extension of a, a sales team extension to an IT company like Dell. Mm -hmm. And so we used to, we would put them based on their revenue and their, how much they sold of our product. We would make sure that they're a registered partner, a preferred partner, a premier mm -hmm. partner, you know, and we would, we would put tiering around them and give them incentives to sell our product over uh, an HP product, if you will. And so they would go into companies and we would help them sell our product into the company. So we were almost like sales managers of those small right. companies to yeah. help them drive their revenue into small companies. 
And so, so that's where we help those companies and they would sell products, they would sell services and whatnot, but they would get rebates and incentives from Dell to yeah. sell our stuff over somebody else. A hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, so that's basically what I did for 13 years. I was a channel <laughs> partner for AT&T among other companies, but AT&T was the main one. And um, so the, the best way I can explain this for, you know, the roofing company, the solar company, the AC company is you're in home services, right? And the way that you can execute this model that David's just gone through essentially is your referral partners. You know, those are your channel partners and those are the ones that are, can go into homes while they're making their sales can add on your services as well. And so that's kind of uh, another example of the way you can apply that to small business, that strategy. To small that's business. exactly right. That's exactly so think, right, Doug. And go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, no, was gonna, I, was, I was gonna say real quick, I was just gonna say that if you think of those channel partners as referral partners, that's exactly what they are. It's it's all tides rise when you say, here's the solution and here's the value that an end customer needs. Here's what their their situation is. And if you can if you can leverage and when when Michael Dell was you know, he, they, it's not, it's not a, uh, it's not a secret. He didn't like the channel when he first started. That's why he built direct Dell direct was where he wanted to go, right. but he found out and a good example of this is he found out that he had um, say 30% market share on the direct side of, of it, mm -hmm. but it was only a third of the market, the total market, two thirds of the market was sold through the channel, that route to market. Yeah. So when, when a, when a Dell account executive would go out, to sell, he would or he or she would be in competition with all these channel partners that were selling multiple other logos, you know, other company stuff. And so you were in trouble if you were trying to sell against a bunch of them. So he's like, OK, I got to get into the channel so I can get that two thirds of the market where he was at the time, I think, single uh, single digit share. And so that's where he started growing his business. Well, and I think this this highlights focus, right? So if my focus is to make a quality computer and service my customer, then and another company's focus is to sell quality computers. You know what I mean? Yeah. One's going to be better than the other. You know, any exactly. way you look at it. I think uh, AT and T right now, sixty to seventy percent of their sales come from uh, channel partners, essentially. Yep. Yep. And so that speaks a lot to if if your business is sales and sales teams, and that's your focus, it's going to be hard to. For another company, you know, size, resources, and everything, of course, are variables, but it's gonna be hard for another company to compete with you at a customer to customer level, you know. And so did did things change when you moved into private equity? Did you have maybe more freedom there? Or, you know, I, I guess how did the dynamics of your role change when you moved into private equity? Yeah, you know, it's funny, you know, as as I learned, you know, I spent 15 years at Dell. And I think I may have told you the story, you know, the first eight to 10 years of my career, I was honing my sales skills, selling financial services to um, contractors, construction companies, farming companies. And so I was selling dozers, excavators, uh, like I was selling the how to finance those because most businesses have a cash flow issue. They're right. like, I want that. I got to go drive my business, but I don't know how to actually afford it. And so the first eight to 10 years was all about how do I actually go out and I sell in a solution? And that's where my finance hat came in and my sales mm -hmm. hat is you want that dozer, you need that job done, but you can't do it if you don't have the cash flow to have the, the income coming in from that if you can't buy it. You can't outlay $200,000. And so I would go put in leasing and servicing and all kinds of stuff to help them go do that. And so at that point, um, I met my mentor who I've been friends with him for 23 years. and. You know, he's still my mentor. And, and he asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I kind of took offense to it. I'm like, well, I'm, I think I was 29 years old at the time. Yeah. And so uh, but what, what was interesting is he made me think about it. And he goes, what do you want to do? I want to be a business uh, owner. I want to be a president. I want to be a GM. I want to do that. And he said, you know, really, if you want to hone that, sales and he said this and sorry for the sales guys out there you know <laughs> you know he said this he said you know, sales guys are a dime a dozen yeah. if you don't understand the PL, the cash flow statement the international side of business the the 
everything that you need to do from cash flow to P&L to balance sheet and how it all works together in an international or even a domestic world. Um, and so I, that's when he told me to come over. I worked in procurement finance. I was a global controller, as I said. I've been around the world, did uh, supply chain financing for folks in China, Middle East, Africa, everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so I did a lot of things at Dell. And so to get to your question, it wasn't a lot different when I went into private equity. The same individual that brought me to Dell, that was an executive at Dell, became the COO and the CFO of a private equity, one of the largest private equity companies out there for a medical device company. And that medical device company was about uh, $1.2 billion. And the private equity company was underwater, had been in that asset for 11 years. And as you know from private equity, you want to stay in three to five years at most. You know, right. you, you want to get in, turn it around and get out of there, you know, from a private equity standpoint. And so um, they asked my mentor to come in as a COO and CFO and said, I'm giving you two years if you take this um uh, this option to take this on, um, then we want you to do this in two years and, and, and you're the last ditch effort. So he brought about half a dozen of us from Dell. And so what I found in private equity, it's the same exact thing as corporate America. It's mm -hmm. there's something that's broken. There needs to be something fixed. So you got to put a strategy around it. You got to put the tactics around it. You got to put the people around it and you got to say, here's the vision and how do you communicate it to everybody to know that you're rowing in the same direction. So when we went there, you know, two years, four months later, I believe it was, we were able to make all their $900 million back plus $200 million, sell the company because we had to break a lot of glass. We had to go in there. And, and what I find the similarities were, it was $1.2 billion. I would have taken that like a business that was at Dell, $1.2 billion of a $100 billion company. Mm -hmm. And so it was a division of Dell, kind okay. of, if you will. And yeah. so same concept. But it was it was like corporate America, but in a smaller kind of uh, realm, if you will. Now, that makes a ton of sense. I I do love what your mentor said, though. Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I feel like that question is applicable at any stage in life, you know, yep. and and, you know, and I've heard that I've heard this kind of go around the social media realm right now. It's like, uh, you know, what, what would you rate yourself? you know, in terms of, you know, a business owner, in terms of a sales, whatever the case is as a human being. And, you know, people's first response is, oh, I'm a 10, you know, because that's, <laughs> that's what everybody's, you know, taught is like, have this crazy confidence or whatever. And what I what I love about that statement that your mentor made it is it means that you always have room for growth. You know, yeah, you're never fully grown. You're, you're, you're spot on, Doug. And, you know, I call it vulnerability. And, you know, I've had, I've, I've had those, I had three moments in my life that what do you want to be when you grow up? One was when I was in eighth grade, one when I was 29 and I didn't know I needed it because I was, I, I thought I had a great career and I was, I was a badass and I could yeah. do what I wanted to do. Same. And then, and then just recently, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up in the second half of my life, you know, kind of thing, you know, and, and that's where I'm at today. And so when I, when I think about, where I came from and what, you know, my dad was my mentor, you know, he dropped out of high school um, and he, he ended up um, having a 25 year career in the military, got to the highest non-commissioned officer ranking. And he taught me a lot about resiliency and creating, you know, opportunities and driving and, and sacrifice and all the things that you got to do, but it mm -hmm. came at a cost. I mean, it was, he was gone all the time. And so in eighth grade, I, I, my, my mentor, Coach Mize, I was not probably on the best grades and I probably wasn't on the greatest path and uh, whatever it was. And he took a, a keen interest in me and said, you know what? You are somebody. You are great. What do you want to do when you grow up? And, and I said one thing, I, I want to be a football player in college. <laughs> and, and he was like, OK, well, David we can make that happen, but you're pretty damn small, you know, and, and I, don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if you can Story do in my that. Life. <laughs> uh, exactly. But he said, he said, but let's parlay that with, let's get you an education. So you have something yeah. to fall back on. And so that was a pivotal moment in my life that said, and every six weeks he was looking at my grades, not in eighth grade only all the way through high school. And wow. I was able to, um, from that, I played a year of college football. I think I may have told you. And I yeah. and I played for Hal Mummy and Mike Leach, their very first college coaching uh, job. Uh, I went and played for them at a small, small, small school in Iowa. Uh, but I, I lived that dream. But what it also did, but more importantly, it did, it got me to college. 
Right. And, and so coach Mize was that person that really got me to that level. And so that was the first aha moment of what I want to be when I grow up. Then it got to my mentor that I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. And then now it's where I'm at today. After 30 years of all of this stuff, what do I want to be when I grow up? And what do I want to <laughs> be known for? So it, it all comes full circle. A hundred percent. When, and when I say, you know, we were, I, I could tell right away that we were aligned uh, even further now because whenever, you know, I thought I had it made, I was 29 years old. I had this teaming multi-million dollar business, you know, and, and, and it, and what I love about it is I got it all from just, just shooting from the hip and, and, and getting the experience and figuring out, Oh, that doesn't work. Let me try this, you know? And, and there, you know, there was no college, there was no, uh, real mentors in my life at the time. It was more, you know, men that showed me what not to do kind of thing. And that, and that didn't help, you know, cause I didn't absorb that unfortunately until a decade later. Right. But anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm 29 years old. I'm talking to my wife and I'm like, you know, um, when I retire, you know, I'm going to retire at 40 naturally. That's what all of us entrepreneurs yep. say. Oh, yeah. We're full of it, you know, <laughs> Yep. but yep. when I retire at 40, I just want to go around the world, you know, around the U S helping small businesses. I don't care if it's a cake shop. I don't care if it's a scooter store. I don't care if it's an electronic store, whatever the case is. I just want to go around the world helping small businesses. I knew at that point I had a knack for solving problems. That's yep. all you do as a consultant. And I said, and I want to do it for free. I want to start a, uh, a nonprofit and all our job is to help small businesses get back to black, you know? And so it, it's, it's crazy how, you know, your journey has a different, different ending for you, not even an ending, but a different route for you, I should say, because, you know, here I am, what, basically seven years later, eight years later, and I'm doing exactly that, you know, I'm just getting paid for it, you know? <laughs> Exactly. So I think that's where you ended up too. Like you, you had this need to to help small businesses and want to be involved, you know, and not necessarily do the whole thing yourself like you did before within the divisions of the companies that you worked for, but uh, come in and provide a specific expertise. Absolutely, and and I think I, I, you you and I had a great conversation. We have a lot of commonalities, uh, but you know, I, I told you the last role that I had at Dell. You know, when I became a um, you know an executive at Dell, I went into my uh, my leader's office, and you know, she said the very first thing she said is, "David, you're a mutt," and I'm like, you know, okay, is that my career? I, I'm now a mutt, you know. And she said, "Don't take offense to it." And so, like I told you, I've been in finance, I've been in operations, I've I got a black belt Six Sigma certification, I've done a lot of things, and it's it's because j just what you were saying is you got to there. Everybody has a different path. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and where you get to at the end, you want to you want to look back and say, you know what? I charted a really great course, but it wasn't the same course someone else had, you know, and it doesn't mean that you're not successful. It just means that you got to where you're at with your life experiences, your grit and what you put into it, giving back to others and, and really receiving from others mm -hmm. based on that. And so that's what I took from that. And that was the last role I had at Dell. And it really it kind of culminated into leaving corporate America into private equity. That took me for five years in private equity. hundred percent. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. So right off the bat, now you're working with small businesses. What are you seeing right away that needs to be executed on better? What is that, that thing you're like, ah, oh, that's what I'm going to attack first. Yeah. And so what, what I'm focused on is the small business owner that is wearing so many hats that, you know, there, as we know, most uh, folks, they get into this and they got to do the finance, they got to do the, the, the customer service, they got to do the sales, <clears throat> they got to put a vision, they got to put a mission together, they got to figure out exactly how are we going to focus on who our customers are. And so my thing is, is like go into those small, medium businesses and I'm finding most of the businesses I go into are B2B. <laughs> excuse me. And, um, you know, they're focused and it doesn't matter industry because I've done med device, I've done construction, right. I've done everything under the sun. And so what I go in and I'm finding is either they are, their sales are growing too fast and they don't have processes and a strategy and the tools and the right people in place, or they are stagnated in growth. They hit a plateau and they can't mm -hmm. get over that plateau. And so <clears throat> a lot of times it's just starting to create that sales plan. Where are you at today? Where have you gone over the last five years? 
where are you going to go in the next year? And, and then putting a plan together with those, those uh, owners. And a lot of times, excuse me, I'm take a drink real quick. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> and so, um, so when I go into a customer, I'm looking for where's the pain point. The pain point is no growth or it's too much growth and not enough um, of a, <clears throat> of a process to get to the next level. Mm-hmm. And so, so I'm finding that they're frustrated. Um, they don't know what to do and they're not having fun. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And it, and it typically has to do with the fact that they have been wearing so many hats and they don't have a system in place for their sales program. Um, are you, when, when you go into a business and, and they don't, they don't have a sales program in place, what's the first thing that you're going to work on in terms of, I guess, systems or documentation? Yeah. So what I do is I look at their infrastructure. The, it's normally a, a three to five month process. <clears throat> the first 30 days is really discovery. What sales resources do you have? What comp plan? If you have a comp plan, what's the job descriptions? Do you have hunters? Do you have farmers? Do you, do you break it up by product and service that you're selling? What's your hiring process? What's your onboarding process? What's your training process? You know, <clears throat> so I'm doing a discovery of all of the things that really drive to, do you have training in place? Do you have the, the people process and tools in place to really get to, here's where we need to pinpoint. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times, you know, I've, I've read lots of articles on sales leaders and the average sales VP will wash out in 19 months. It's yeah. because they don't really understand how to set something before you start running. You got to understand where you're at. Mm-hmm. And I find a lot of business owners and a lot of consultants, high, high powered consultants sometimes will come in and they'll say, this is what you need. And, and they haven't even listened. They haven't listened to yeah. what the problem is. And so I don't, when I go into customers, I don't look for one thing. They may have a great training program, onboarding program, great team, but they just don't have a vision and a process with leading indicators to say, here's how we're going to get there. So that's what we focus on. And so we basically take all of those things in the first 30 days. We then put a game plan together to say, here is your one through five things that we're going to do. Here are the priorities. Here's the timeline. We're going to put it together. And it normally within three to six months, we're really humming. After that, that's kind of stage one and stage two. Stage three is like, can you afford a talented VP of sales that normally is $250,000, $350,000 fully burdened or even mm-hmm. more? Um, and a lot of these guys, a lot of the companies say, I can't afford that. Let me come in as your fractional. I'll do it on a fractional basis and I will be your outsourced VP of sales and I'll manage your team. Mm -hmm. I'll drive your team, your one-on-ones with the sales folks. And that way you can drive your vision of the company or wherever else is most important. And I'll be that sales guy without having to be that VP of sales, without you having to go hire somebody and then not be able to have the training to get them up to speed. And then they wash out in 19 months. A hundred percent. No, I love it. And I I love what you said about, you know, oftentimes these uh, consultants or people in an advisory role in general, right? Whether you're just having a conversation with another business owner or, you know, you're, you're, being paid to advise someone or to consult someone they do, they have this, their way of doing things. And that doesn't have a long-term effect in my mind. Honestly, it just kind of washes off after a while, because if you don't ingrain it into the culture and the people in the company, you know, and and that's what I always say to my clients. It's like, Hey, we're taking the genius that's in here because obviously it works. You know, you're doing 500,000, you're doing a million, you're doing 5 million, 10 million, whatever the case is. Obviously it works, you know, yeah. what we're trying to do is get it to work for you. And, and what that means is, all right, now you don't have to do it every day. Exactly. And, and it's so- a repeatable engine that it, where you were getting to, and sorry to interrupt, is that that's that life cycle process. This is never a one and done. And, and I find this and, and, and I learned this a lot in private equity, you know, and I love, I love consultants. I'm not saying anything bad about consultants because I am a consultant, yeah. but a lot of times <clears throat> you bring in these high powered consultants, you pay a lot. They theorize and say, here's what you got to do. And then they walk out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what I try to do is I theorize, I align, and then I implement alongside them. Mm-hmm. And then drive as checkups. If you need me once a month, you need me 
you know, to do this one uh, a day a week for you, I'll do that or however you want me to do it. But you got to keep this thing on the rails because if you don't do that, you're going to be back in the same place and you're going to be out money for the consultant you paid for. And then you're going to be finding yeah. someone else to come back and do it again. Well, I think I think some business owners get a little addicted to it, you know, where they're joining the mastermind They're, you know, then they find this, you know, and, and it, it, it's the game that we're in now, you know, at least on my side of things, it's the you know, social media authority that we create through our um, social media engine, which is or an organic machine that brings us leads, right? And so yep. we almost have this uh, mini celebrity type thing. And so they just want to work with you. And they don't, they don't really pay attention to the fact that, hey, we're not really doing anything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so that can happen. And so this is this is really for my own curiosity, right? So what I've been finding is I'll do a one-on-one -on -one engagement with the client. We'll go in with a specific, you know, Hey, we're going to build a sales program. We'll build the sales program and the client's like, Hey, I want you to stay on. How can we do something here? Right. And that kind of created the, the fractional CSO, very similar to the fractional VP of sales, you know, service. And so I, I started doing that. Right. And, and so it's one of the things that I offer, but I also recognize that it has a capacity to it. Right. So what do you feel like, or how do you set yours up so that you don't fill that capacity too quick and you can service more small business owners? Absolutely. So I, instead of doing this on like an hourly rate, I do it mm -hmm. on a project, you know, and, and okay. again, it all comes back down to what do you need, Mr. and Mrs. Owner? What is it that you need? One is a lot of times it's just an evaluation of the infrastructure. And so we get past that and say, you know what, I really need somebody to run my sales organization and then we then determine how much time is that going to take? Normally, what I can do in a day, um, a week for a company, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not having to deal with all the political and the, the bureaucratic and all the things that are whatever. So I right. will then say, based on my time, I think this is going to be a 10 hour a week kind of uh, opportunity for me to go do this for you on a, a year plus basis. Mm -hmm. Here's how much I'll charge you each month. And it's a month to month basis. So if you don't like what you're seeing and I'm not delivering the deliverables that we agreed to, you can get out of this in 30 days. And so I always put it on a project basis. I always determine here's how much I think it's going to happen. And here is the, the, the value that I'm going to bring and the deliverables that we're going to agree upon. And we're going to see the outcomes. <clears throat> and then every 30 days we check on, are we delivering that? I love that. I, I love it because it's a performance based model in the sense that, Hey, if David wants to stick around and continue to be my VP of sales at a fractional level, David's got to perform. You know what I'm saying? My the next, that's my performance. Yeah. yeah. That's my performance plan. And they 100%. put me on a pit for 30 days. And mm -hmm. then after that, it's like, you know what? Thank you. Uh, got everything I needed out of you. Yeah. And that's fine. And, and so I, I want that to be a win-win. I don't want to come in and somebody's going to say, no, I need you here every single day. I'm like, that's not yeah. what we agreed to. Yeah. You know, here's what we agreed to. And that's why we put it on a project basis. So sometimes I may work 12 hours. Sometimes I make eight hours. Sometimes it may be 15 hours, but I do it on a project to say, here's what we're going to do. And then we'll reevaluate it, you know, and say, you know what, this is a lot more work. Here's mm -hmm. what I'm delivering to you. And here's what we can't get to. And then we just renegotiate. Yeah. It, and, and I'm going <clears> to <throat> be out of character here for a little bit. I'm going to complain for a second. Okay. This is, this is all, all of my products are, are, very uh, prorated in a sense, right? So it's, if somebody engages me, let's just say it's, it's a 25 grand project over 90 days, right? Uh, and and we're 30 days in and they don't like how it's going. They don't want to work with me anymore. Well, they've only made a 10K payment to that point. So it's prorated. I refund whatever hasn't been used yet. And then we move on, you know? And I, and I do that for a reason because I've been a small business owner for 13 years and I hate contracts. I do. I know it's not a good business model. I should have contracts, you know what I'm saying? But I don't like them. I don't want to use them. You know what I'm saying? Other than to protect myself, that's about it, you know? But I don't want to lock somebody into that. My cleaning company, so annually, they re auto-renew my contract. It's it's in the con – <laughs> I didn't even yeah, know it. And I'm exactly. like, six months ago, you know, I was looking for expenses to cut. And I'm like, okay, I spend five $600 a month on this cleaning company when it's just me and – my producer Ryan in the office, you know, yeah, it's like yeah, we can, yeah. we can do this, you know? And they're like, Oh no, you're in a contract for another 10 months. It renewed two months ago. And I'm just like, I can't believe people still do business like this. And I get it. It is a better business model. 
because now you're guaranteeing well, those those payments. You know, I, I think it's a it's a it's a um, a revenue. Yeah, it's a yeah. revenue generation that gives you consistency. But the problem is not being upfront and transparent with a customer on that. It's going to put a bad uh, taste in the mouth of a customer that the voice of the customer to other customers is going to get out at some point. So my value is, hey, listen, here's what it is. If that's not what you want to do, then we can agree to disagree and we move on and do something different. Yeah. But I don't ever want somebody to feel like they are locked into something and they're not getting the value out of it because it doesn't help them. And I can use my time somewhere else because I know I can bring I have enough confidence in myself that I can bring value to another company. So that eight to 10 to 12 hours, I can use somewhere else. I love it. A hundred percent. So, you know, one of the things that I've, I've been on a journey with this last two years, and, and it, it's really two things, the last two questions, but the first one is uh, core values. You know, do you feel like, or, or what, what role do core values play with the sales team? It, it's, it, it is um, essential. You know, when I think about leadership, and I think about the creating value. And by the way, you know, TLC uh, stands for trust, likability, and create value. And when I think about why I did that is in the 30 years that I've been around, you know, working and even before that. And, and when I go back and think about the eighth grade coach and I think about my dad, and I think about every, every relationship I had, all the best relationships were based on trust. You had to enjoy each other's company. You had to you had to say, hey, I don't mind getting on a call with this person or having lunch or having a beer or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. Yeah. But then the last piece of it is everybody has value to give and it's different from the next person. Mm -hmm. And so that creating value of saying I am interacting with somebody, I trust them, I like them. And now I know that what this person's good at can help me and I can give back to that person what I'm good at. And now all tides rise again. And so when I think about leaders and I think about what they're trying to do, it's like trying to help others and have the core values of giving, being adaptable, being curious, being a risk taker, doing all the things that you got to do. And, and I think about those leaders that, and I think you, you use the word that I really always focus on is this curiosity, you know, especially in this rapid changing technology driven era that we're in. You know, you have to have foresight of what's going to be out there and be curious and be able to take those risks. And so every team has to understand that change is inevitable. And as long as everybody understands the core values that everybody is going to be respected, you're going to give versus take. You're going to do all the things together to really make sure the team grows and then the individual grows. I remember in, in high school football, we had these shirts and it was team me pride. So the team came first, then it was me, but it was a lot of pride around making sure the team got all the accolades. Then it was about you and, mm -hmm. and, and really making sure the team was, was a well-oiled machine to win. And so I think those core values are really important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and uh, that philosophy that you just went through, I just feel like us as humans, is the, that's how we were built. We yeah. were built to serve. You know, so this idea of like, hey, I have to put myself first. You know, I, I get that to a certain point. I got to breathe. I got to eat. You know what I mean? Yep. I got to put yeah. <laughs> over my head, you know. But after that, it is about impact. And it is about that that value that you bring to your team or to your client or whatever the case is. Because that's how we were built. That's how we were made, you know. Yeah. Yeah. My dad always told me, he said, food, shelter, water, you know. The, you know, every you, you have to make sure that you, you at the very basics, it's food, shelter, water, but everybody pretty much can get that. I mean, you know, I think I think I think we all know that if we do what we're supposed to do, if we're 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 good citizens in the community and doing the right things. But then it's after all of that, what can I do to help everybody? How yeah. can we really go drive and be a servant leader, if you will? OK, with all that being said, the, the last question, uh, what does legacy mean to you and what legacy do you want to leave behind? You know, my legacy, I want to make sure that there the folks that are underserved and that don't have somewhere to to have an inspiration. The legacy I want to bring is I was an army brat, as I said, 
And so I'm starting to, to write down and I'm going to, I'm going to write a book at, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to call it, um, uh, the, uh, basic training for the military brat. And, and that is about how do I, you know, when I think about the adaptability, the resiliency, the curiosity, the, you know, the concerns in, 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 you know, young kids, a lot of times, you know, the military, um, you know, they get a lot of accolades, the wives, at, you know, or the spouses do as well, which is great. You know, I, you know, I know you're from San Antonio and my dad was, you know, uh, retired there at Fort Hood in Austin, outside of Austin. Yeah. Um, so I, I love that. But my legacy I want to bring back is giving back to those kids that are in the boys club or in the girls club or in, in, and they're in army bases or they're having to move and they, they don't know where to go. And so I want to put some basic training to take all the leadership qualities that I think I've learned, but they're, they're synonymous with life qualities and life learnings. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to do is I want to do the, as you're doing nonprofit, I want to do something that's going to give back to the youth, especially focused on, you know, the military kids that are constantly moved around and they have to meet new friends every single time. So that's the legacy I want to bring, you know, in, the, in this next chapter of my life, if you will. I love it. We, we ask this question on every podcast episode and um, I get all kinds of answers. And I, and I, and what I really love is the specificity. Is that a word? Spec yeah. spec specificity. <laughs> yeah, you and I both, that's, we got that in common too. We can't get it right. <laughs> the but how there you yeah, go. <laughs> yeah. How specific uh, your, your legacy that you want to leave behind is, and you know exactly who you're going to impact. You know, a lot of people do answer with, you know, I want to bring value to the world. I want a, a positive impact for everybody that I came in contact with, but I, I do think at least part of that legacy needs to be specific, you know? Yep. And so I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. You're welcome. All right, brother. Well, thank you so much for coming on the, coming on the, the podcast today. I think we accomplished our mission. We really brought those, you know, fortune 50 and private equity kind of strategies that sales teams use and just in business in general that uh, our fellow business owners can learn from. So I, I thank you for that as well. No, I, I really appreciate you having me on, Doug, and it's been a pleasure. And it was great that Zach introduced us. So let's stay in touch Absolutely. for sure. All right, brother. Let's get building. All right. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Building Great Sales Teams podcast. We really do appreciate it. As you know, we believe that great leaders build great teams. How do you become a great leader? you learn from the greats. Join us at the Million Dollar Mastermind put on by Ryan Stuman in Frisco, Texas, and learn everything that you need to learn to be that great leader. The link will be in the description below. As always, we ask that you like, share, and subscribe wherever you consume podcasts so you can stay up to date with the Building Great Sales Teams podcast. Let's get building.